listening to Temple Talk from Jerusalem, Israel. Rabbi Chaim Mishman here together with Yitzhak Ruven. And today is the 20th day of the month of Tammuz 5779, July 23rd, 2019. The Shabbat here in the land of Israel, the penultimate Torah portion of the Book of Numbers, Parshat Matot. And it's also Shabbat Mavarchim, the Sabbath of the blessing of the new moon, of the month of Av, Rosh Chodesh Av, will be ushered in next week on Friday, August 2nd. And uh, just so you won't be confused, in the diaspora outside of the land of Israel, this week is Parshat Pinchas. And next week, when we conclude the Book of Numbers with Parshat Masay, our brethren outside the land of Israel will be doing a double portion of Matot and Masay, and thus, we will all be on the same page once again, which we haven't been since before Passover. We'll be on the same page to begin the book of Deuteronomy, Parshat Devarim, which will be read on the Sabbath of Vision, Shabbat Chazon, which actually will be the ninth of Av this mm-hmm. year, because the fast of the ninth of Av, like the fast of the 17th of Thomas, will be deferred to Sunday. And here we are once again in the period of time known as Shloshet HaShavuot, the three weeks. Or Bein HaMetzarim. Yes, that is an expression from the Book of Lamentations that all her all her foes pursued her, uh, um, caught up to her Bein HaMetzarim, between the straits. Bein HaMetzarim, between the straits and the narrow place of suffering. That's where we are in these three weeks, are the traditional time of mourning for the loss of the Holy Temple, um, depending on your particular level of level of uh, not observance, but on your right R I T E, in other words, your extraction. The uh, the Sephardic Jews and the Ashkenazic Jews have different levels of um, uh, how should I say different levels of observance. Uh, uh, well, it has to do with the um, the gradual um, uh, increase in the intensity of the morning customs. Um, w- there are certain customs that are in effect from the beginning of the three weeks, which began the 17th of Tammuz, such as um, not cutting hair, um, not having um, a wedding, um, uh, refraining from joyous occasions. And then these customs uh, increase in their velocity and their intensity for for um, in certain communities from the from the beginning of the month of Av. In fact, the Shulchan Ruch, the Code of Jewish Law, states when the month of Av enters, we lessen in our joy and our mirth. Um, it's not a propitious time, considered to be a difficult time. And then there's the week in which the ninth of Av actually occurs. Of course, this week, this year, there isn't really a week in which it occurs because it actually occurs on a Sunday, preceded only by a Shabbat. And all this, all these levels of meaning and observance and customs of mourning and uh, kind of a time of um, self, um, I wouldn't call it self-mortification, that's not the Jewish way, but self-restraints um, from, from certain things has to do with the fact that all year round we are kind of distracted. And we're used to life, living life as it is, and we're not so focused, as although we should be, we're not so focused on the destruction of the Holy Temple. And this period of time in which the events actually occurred, especially with an understanding of the linear uh, nature, not the linear, the cyclical nature, excuse me, of the Jewish calendar, we understand that we're presented with an opportunity for tikkun, we're presented with an opportunity for reliving and for fixing things, mistakes from the past. And so this whole period of time on the calendar is about... Uh, really internalizing what the loss of the Holy Temple really means. Um, of course, our, our um, um, input into that that we'd like to share with you um, th- and that we do share every year is that it's, it, it behooves us, it's important for us to really um, ponder th- the meaning of this in a deep, deep way and not just be satisfied with fulfilling our obligation in terms of showing how pious we are, you know, that we mourn the loss of the temple and we're, you know, we're not going to exhibit outward signs of joy. And like, for for example, the Ashkenazic Jews in the 
in the nine days preceding Tisha B'Av, they, they refrain from bathing for pleasure, um, they, uh, they, don't, they don't eat meat, and they don't drink wine, and um, they don't even wear freshly laundered clothes. There's all these symbols are actually uh, things that are, um, that are actually practiced by people that are mourning for a relative, God forbid. And then we, we, we increase in these levels of, of, um, of reminders, you know, of, of mourning, until we get to the ninth of Av, when, when we have this very remarkable uh, situation in which the entire house of Israel is basically a mourner for, for a close relative, for a deep loss. And that's when we actually become mourners. We, we, we act like mourners, and we don't sit on chairs. And we don't greet each other, and we and we uh, are fasting. It's a, a very intense level of, of mourning for the loss of the temple. Thing is, um, some, somebody was asking me. You know, uh, so we've been teaching for a long time now that it's not enough just to just to be, you know, addressing these things on a surface surface level. We have to really think about what it means. We have to really try to rise up because the purpose of our mourning it's it's direct it's directed it's focused it's not we're not just crying we're not just mourning over something that we can't do something about but the purpose of our mourning is to try and make us realize that we want to stop mourning we want to do something about it we want to rise up we want to rebuild and uh, actually we have this whole lesson on Tammuz that we actually I believe we have it posted have we not Yitzhak the lesson on Tammuz uh, the lesson on the month of Tammuz mm-hmm. we have it posted it's a it's a class in which we kind of explain the whole um, history of the, the name of the month of Tammuz oh, and, right. the, and the whole conundrum of, of the crying of Tammuz as is reflected by the mysterious verse in Ezekiel and why the month is called Tammuz and what the challenge is being issued to all of Israel to rise up and uh, break the cycle of, of uh, crying um, for no reason. Somebody was asking me um, about the fast of the 17th of, of Tammuz, which, by the way, this, this year, it was, it was called a nidche, right? Which means mm-hmm. that it was, it was deferred to Sunday. And the laws of a, of a fast that are deferred are uh, taken into consideration uh, certain leniencies for people that are having a hard time finishing it. It's not actually the day itself. Right. But somebody was saying to me, kind of facetiously, kind of tongue-in-cheek or whatever, like why? Why do we even bother fasting? Like, if, if someone was trying to say to me, if you think, so, if you so, if you're so convinced that we need to rebuild the temple, so then why just like why why fast at all? Like that's old school. Like if you're oh, if you're talking about like, you know, like uh, stopping the cycle of uh, of, of, of mourning because you say that it's not sincere, you know, mourning for its own sake. Like you want to rebuild, so why why fast? And I I took umbrage to that, and I said, um, no, you don't understand me at all. God forbid I, I, I should, that we shouldn't fast. First of all, when the entire house of Israel is doing something, you don't separate yourself from the community because there's great spiritual value and power to unity. And when the entire house of Israel is, is in mourning and the entire house of Israel is fasting, you must as well because the fact is uh, it's a very powerful spiritual tool. It's a very great catalyst to prayer and to repentance. So you, you don't break that. And of course you... you uh, are part of of that, but more so, what's your kavana? Like, what what is your intention when you're when you're um, fasting? Because my intention when I'm fasting is that I'm broken, and I'm fasting with great deep feelings of repentance over the fact that we're not rebuilding the temple. <laughs> In other words, there's a difference between fasting over the fact that you know, like you're blaming God, like mm-hmm. you know, you broke the temple, you don't rebuild it. We're waiting for you to rebuild it, do something about it, and fasting, saying like. We have got to do something about the situation. We have got to rise up. So that so, so yeah. There's definitely every reason in the world to fast because we need to become the people that we need to be in order to take our mission seriously, in order to take ourselves seriously, in order to take Hashem's promises seriously, and in order to fill ourselves with the, with the holy audacity and the move and the momentum and the belief, and the integrity necessary for us to finally decide that we've lived long enough without the Holy Temple, and essentially that's what this whole period of time is really all about. You know, we've reached a point in our history uh, since 1967 when the Temple Mount is in our hands, as uh, Motogorda uh, said when the Israeli paratroopers uh, liberated the Temple Mount. Temple Mount is in our hands. 
and that has created a a whole uh, seismic shift in our consciousness, which didn't happen immediately. You know, it's taken time for our brain pan to catch up to reality. I think actually, if a generation is twenty years. Uh, officially, it mm-hmm. took a couple of generations for for it to really sink in yeah. to the to the you say brain pan to the collective consciousness of the body of Israel. That hey, it's in our hands. It really is in our it's hands. In our hands, and the fate and the future and the destiny of it and us is in our hands. And just even among the people I talk to, friends of mine I've known for thirty years, they they're different today than they were thirty years ago. Con- you know, concerning the Temple Mount, concerning the Temple, concerning the three weeks. They don't think the same way. You know, some people say, well, you know, why, why are we mourning? Because we have so much today. You know, like we have a state, we have an army, we're, we're growing, we're building, you know. But, of course, if you go up to the, I say go up to the Temple Mount and you'll see the one thing that still is in ruins. But even that questioning why we're mourning is a step forward, if you understand what I'm saying, rather than just saying let's mourn because, you know, beat our breast yeah, because uh, look, we can't do anything about it. I see it. what you're saying. You it's know, a, it's, it's a progress. step forward in that it's, it is it's like... It's an it's a, it's a acceptance of, of reality, at and least. It, and it's also kind of, like you said, like it's a deep paradigm shift. Like a person look at themselves saying, like, wait a minute, the situation is not the same as it always was. We're not in exile, in the same type of exile. We're not under under foreign rule. We, we, but, and, but that's the whole point. That's a reason to fast because we need to internalize that and to say, but so, right. then, so then let's do something about it. And, 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 and all the while that we aren't and that we don't have that click, then there's, there is w- what to fast about. And the fast is basically, uh, uh, bottom line, you talk, the fast is like you get to that edge after you're fasting for a while and you're, and you're starting to feel a little bit uh, very, very much that you need Hashem in your life. That's what <laughs> fasting does to you. And you say, please, God, give us the strength to do what we have to do. Give, don't, you know, let us feel that you're, that you're with us and give us the, the strength and the courage to do what we have to do. And, and there's the difference is that maybe there's a certain mentality that looks at the fasting as of saying, like, Hashem, like, we're all totally in your hands. Do something for us. It's all about you. Do something for us. And listen, there's no question about it that everything is about Hashem. Everything is in His hands. It's all about Him. It's not about us. We're not in control, but still in all... On this particular issue, unfortunately, I say unfortunately, f- you know, for some of us to to have to, to have to process, we are in control because he. What do we want from him? Like you say, like uh, Motogor said, the Temple Mount is in our hands. It was it was a watershed event of, of, not only modern history but of all history. And it's like Hashem, like it's like gave us the Temple Mount on a silver platter. It's still inexplicable a, to gave war. Us a gift wrapped and war we have historians to, and, to this and, day and can't even figure it out. It. It's done, and it's like he's like saying, like, okay, we had our spat, but it's like it's children, like it's over now. Like let's get together, you know what I'm saying? And and instead, like it took us generations just to, just to even process that and just to even get get our get our minds wrapped around that. And entire generations of, of Jews all over the world, and Israelis in particular, grew up being told that the Temple Mount is not anything that has anything to do with our reality anymore. And uh, that was a terrible, terrible crime uh, that was committed to us, mm-hmm. and ours is the generation of reclamation, restoration, and um, inspiration. And that's, that's basically what's going on here, is that we have a, we have a totally new page in the book um, and even and honestly like it's so amazing even to have this broadcast now we and every year during these weeks we have our broadcasts that are focused on the three weeks focused on the morning focused on the process of uh, that that it, that Am Israel that the whole nation of Israel is going through during these weeks and it's and that too has changed over over the years because you know, 15 years ago, you and I, Rabbi, I felt we were a voice in the wilderness. Yeah, we you, and, you and I have been badgering nobody our, was our listening there. public for, for, <laughs> for a decade and a half. We've been, we've been you know, branded as being all sorts of things, and nobody was talking about this when we started it. And the fact is, n- everything has changed. There is such a totally d- different attitude in the Israeli public, and I think it's seeping into the consciousness of world jewelry as well, uh, regarding... The reality of the Temple Mount and 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 what has to happen here, and that is a tremendous blessing. It's unheard of. It's unprecedented. Yes, there's a lot of problems still. Yes, there's a, there's a lot of a lot a lot to be upset about with this system and with the concept of 
of what's going on in the Temple Mount and uh, Israeli sovereignty, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the fact is, th- this is all part of the process. All part of the process of redemption is exactly where we are. We are at right now, and I think that there's a lot of people that are a lot of Jews that are viewing the three weeks of mourning and the concept of mourning on Tisha B'Av, I think they're viewing it differently than they viewed it years ago. I think they're starting to look at it in a way like, you know what, they're looking at their watch and they're saying like, this is okay, uh, it's that time again, but this this can't go on. This is not the way it's supposed to be. This is, we're not accomplishing anything here. It's not about just mourning for its own sake. It's a, It's about mourning so that you're so totally ready to be finished with the morning that you that you are un, are un understanding that it it needs to change you know we've reached a a yam suf moment we've reached a sea of reeds moment we're standing at the edge of our destiny the edge of our future and we have to move forward there's no going back and there's no standing still either it just doesn't work you know the the past is was it the past is close behind the past the egyptian army is 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 getting closer you know the past we can't be drawn back into the past we have to move forward and the only way to move forward is to move forward not to stand still so slowly slowly people are and the nation as a whole is moving forward i believe and coming to terms with our responsibility to ourselves to god to the temple mount itself uh, and to the world vis-a-vis what we're going to do on the Temple Mount. And, uh, you know, we may move forward uh, incrementally or we may plunge forward. We may have a nachshon that just leaps ahead and everybody fa- I don't know, but we can't stand still. We have to keep moving forward. And I think that's really what's happening. And it is a, a very, very tumultuous time spiritually for, for the Jewish people these, these three weeks, each in their own way. And all of the morning customs are designed to help us focus on the fact that something is very, very wrong with this picture. And we're not proceeding uh, business as usual. We're not proceeding pretending that everything is okay. And we cannot really um, experience a level of personal joy, like a personal joyous ex- a joyous occasion, like a, a, a wedding. Or like you're not supposed to really buy items of joy during this period of time there, there and there are many many laws you can l- look them up laws and customs relating to these to these three weeks and all of them are designed to keep us to keep our consciousness focused and not distracted from this reality that we're living with complacency uh, is the big enemy and it always is all 365 days of the year and again, as something we've stressed in the past is that the idea of the three weeks is not to, you know, uh, take time out for uh, from our life, our busy lives for three weeks, and then, you know, just wash uh, our hands of it and say, "Phew, that, I'm glad I got that over with. Let's party." And move on. No, we have to bring this this uh, intensified consciousness into our everyday life and and live with it, not to feel like we're, you know mourning all the time but to realize that we've got to resolve this issue and again the, it's like a hot potato that uh, has been you know thrown into our hands and we have to resolve the issue the temple mount is in our hands we cannot part of the, hot the potato, other way we can't walk away from it i think part of the hot potato uh, angle is that a lot of people feel like well you know like what, what does this even have any relevance in modern Israel today? You know, like you, you, this whole idea of still mourning for the temple, and, and that was p- our ancient biblical past, but we're, you know, like a, a world power now, or whatever. <laughs> are we a world power? Whatever it is that we are now, uh, what does it have to do with anything? And that's really the whole idea, is that, honestly, if you understand what Israel is all about, if you understand what this people is all about, and their connection to this land, and their destiny, that's that's everything and and that's exactly what the answer to the question is the big question is about, about Israel however you phrase it this is the answer it's the answer to the to the to the mystery of what we're doing here it's the answer to all of the detractors of Israel yes. whether it's BDS or whether it's this uh, government or that minister the answer is that the picture that you're looking at now is not complete and that it, it will not be until we see the fulfillment of the words of the prophets. For example, the prophet Isaiah who tells us that, that it shall come to pass 
in the end of days that the mountain of the house of Hashem will be firmly established at, as the head of the hills and all the nations will stream to it and they will say, let us go with you because, we, because God is with you. And out of Zion shall, be, shall come forth Torah and the word of God from Jerusalem. That is the contribution of Israel to the whole world, not just uh, a great uh, Israeli television, which is a fairly new phenomenon, <laughs> not just our unbelievable innovations, whether it's in medicine, science. Don't forget um, cherry tomatoes. Uh, all, all of the incredible accomplishments that this tiny nation has given to the world in so few years, that's not it. That's not it at all. What it is, is the knowledge of Hashem, closeness to Hashem. The reality of man's relationship with God is going to be magnified and amplified and taught by Israel and made accessible by Israel. And that's what the Holy Temple is really all about. And the fact that we're not able to do that on that scale and that we're, we're not getting that and that that connection hasn't yet been made, that's the tragedy. It's, and so the tragedy of the lack of the Holy Temple is a tragedy for all mankind, not just for Israel. That's why the prophets all tell us that the, the temple in Jerusalem is the secret of the peace of the whole world. That's why the prophet Haggai tells us that economic ruin and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and decay, whether it's physical or spiritual, is all a result of the fact that the temple is not standing. And so this is a, a something of a universal theme. And so these days of mourning definitely have a, a application, a, a, a resonance with non-Jews as well. Anyone who has any sense and who has any desire to bond with Hashem, the God of Israel, and who feels the pain of the of the Shekhinah, as it were, exiled from, from her place, realizes that the Holy Temple is um, the mystery that lies at the heart of everything. And that's what these days are all about. So it's worthwhile, our friends, if you're busy all year round and if you're distracted, it's worthwhile to take a little time during this special period of time and try to reflect in a, in a, in a deep way and internalize um, this message that we want to show Hashem, and that's, and that's what the, mo the morning customs are all about also. It's not just for us, it's not just psychological, it's to show Hashem that we realize that we cannot go on without the Holy Temple. That is the truth. Nothing but the truth. And uh, so it will be. Probably I'm hearing music. What about you? Uh, not yet. I'm not hearing that. It's very possible my hearing is a little bit off. But uh, there it is. So stay with us. We shall be right back. Temple Talk. Welcome back to Temple Talk. This is Yitzhak Ruven with Rabbi Chaim Richman here in Jerusalem, Israel. Today is the 20th day of the month of Tammuz, 5779, July 23rd, 2019. This coming Shabbat here in the land of Israel, we'll be reading Parshat Matot, the second to last penultimate Torah reading of the Book of Numbers, a.k.a. Bamidbar. And in uh, the diaspora, uh, Jews will be reading a parashat Pinchas, which we read last week. And next week, as the rabbi explained earlier, uh, we will be reading uh, parashat Mas'e, the final parsha of Numbers, and Diaspora Jewry will be reading the double portion of Matot and Mas'e. And so next week, we'll all be back on the same page after a few months now where uh, we have been one parsha ahead of the Diaspora due to the the uh, ins and outs of the Hebrew calendar. This coming Shabbat also, as the rabbi mentioned, is Shabbat Mavarachin, which will be uh, blessing the upcoming uh, new moon of the month of Av. And we've been talking all about the three weeks, all about the rebuilding the Holy Temple, why we mourn, what we need to do, a specific period uh, in history at this moment uh, 
in mankind. And I'd like to get back to that, but let's talk a little bit about the parasha, uh, Parashat Matot, which uh, two major things take place in it, actually three things. It begins with a whole discussion of nidarim, of vows that people take, and then it goes on to the war that God commands Moshe to conduct against the Midianim, the Midianites, uh, who had uh, plotted that, uh, hatched that horrible plot against Israel, which ensnared Israel and caused uh, the death of many people. And Israel indeed goes out to battle, led uh, at least the spiritual uh, leadership was, was led by Pinchas, who uh, made his first appearance uh, only recently. And now he is the Kohen who leads the army who uh, I should say he um, doesn't lead the army militarily, but again, he leads the army spiritually in battle. And they defeat the Midianites, and they also kill uh, uh, Bilam, by the by. Um, and then they div divvy up the spoils. It's a big part of the, of the reading this week. And then... There's a whole criticism about... Um about the spoils and there's a, and uh, fitting into th that also is a whole concept of uh, kashrut in a way regarding vessels. Mm -hmm. Then, proceeding after all that, uh, and after Israel has has wiped out the the Midianites from this area and there's all this empty area, uh, then we have the story of how the the tribes of Reuven and Gad both came to Moshe and said, this land here that we've just conquered is a fantastic land for our livestock. our livestock. And so we'd like to settle here and not go over the Jordan, not go into the land, into the land of Israel that God's promised us. Uh, and this is the exact opposite consciousness, mentality, uh, worldview. I don't know how to... I give you a bigger word to describe it than the daughters of Tzlavchad, who we read about last week, who, who went to Moshe and said, our father died and he had no sons, and the laws of inheritance as they stand right now means that we'll, he'll have his offspring will not inherit his portion in the land of Israel. And we, his five daughters, would like to be uh, the recipients of that inheritance so that his name will be, will be continued. And Moshe, this is what I find interesting, Moshe then takes their question and asks God what to do. God gets the answer, says they're speaking justly, do what they, they're 100% right. You know, and a whole new set of, of provisions is made in Torah for, the, for a situation where there is no uh, male offspring in a situation like this. Now in the case of Reuben and God, they go to Moshe and they, and they say, we don't want to go in. And Moshe gets very upset with them, and he, in fact, uh, mentions immediately the story of the spies. He said, you're being just like the spies were. You're, you're not wanting to go in is going to, is going to discourage the rest of the, the, rest of and the it, tribes. And it will, also, it will also, yeah, in other words, not only is it disgusting that you don't want to go in, but you're, you will lower the spirits uh, of the, your brethren. And, and you're going to cause a disaster just like the spies did. And they said, well, what if we propose this? What if we will build our, our cities and we'll build our pens for our livestock, and, but we'll send all our warriors to, to lead the fight for the other tribes to, to gain their, their uh, inheritances, which actually historically is what happened. And Moshe, as it were, to, you know, in, makes, makes a deal with them, but he doesn't bring the question to God. He doesn't, it's not, it, this doesn't come with God's blessing, this, this arrangement. And it's almost, to me, it's like Moshe didn't feel like, like God shouldn't be burdened with this or, you know, I'm not going to ask God to bless this. Like, he, he makes it. I would it look at it differently. It's like it, when it came to the women, that was a halachic question. Mm -hmm. you know, that, a precedent needed to be set in Torah law because mm -hmm. uh, until that point, the, Moses' understanding of Torah law that Hashem gave him is that it was patrilineal. Right. So, too, when it, earlier 
when uh, a group of people came forward and asked about being uh, excluded from the Passover offering, mm -hmm. that was also going to have a direct implication on the interpretation of Torah law, because Passover offering has to be on the 14th of Nisan. And then, lo and behold, Hashem there acquiesced and uh, said, uh, yeah, that's a good idea. And you know, our whole understanding of the Passover, uh, the second Passover, the 14th of Iyar, is that it's the holiday of second chance. Right. But Hashem was waiting for us to ask right. to give us the second chance. Mm -hmm. And so Hashem said, I'm basically said, I'm amending the law of the Torah. Here too, when it came to the Daraz of Tzlef Chad, he said, I'm amending the law of the Torah. Mm -hmm. And yes, you're right. A man that has no male inheritance, it will go to the women. But here, I think this is different because this is not uh, an amendation of Torah law. This is a one time. This is a heart matter. Uh -huh. In other words, Hashem is like, is like, what's going on here? Like, I've been talking about this land for a very long time. Right. I've been talking about it since your fav your father Abraham. That this is where you're going to be. Like, what? This is what you have to say. So that's like your heart is not in it. It's like it's like last week uh, in Parshat Pinchas we were talking about that little extra something, mm -hmm. that that extra spirit of motivation that, that, that was Pinchas had, that, and that the that daughters, the daughters had, had, and that, 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 that had. And by the way, I think that also is um, is why this parsha begins with vows. Mm -hmm. Because this, ho this whole idea of the vows and the oaths, it basically it's a, it's a portion of Torah law relating to the fact that a person can take an ordinary item and sanctify it. Sanctify something extra on themselves, uh, uh, something of, uh, give something a spiritual dimension, spiritual value through the spoken word, through the expression of the spoken word. First of all, one of the most important things that we learn from this, that there, there are umpteen pages written of, of understanding is the value of the power of the word, the power of speech, the power mm -hmm. of what it means to be able to take something seriously and express yourself seriously about something. And so too, when it came to um, the tribes that asked for, you know, Reuven and God, they expressed themselves and they, 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 they made a promise. And they kept their promise. Yes, I'm going to get I'm get back to that in a moment. But I, I, I'm saying I think that the reason that the parsha begins with this idea of vows is opening up your heart in the deepest way. What's going on here is that we've taken this people, we've been following them all the way through the book of Numbers, and I already made the point last week in our video about the transition between the generation of the desert and then the generation that's going into the land of Israel. This people has matured. They've become a nation. Mm -hmm. They've become a nation, albeit of tribes, of individuals, of families, but now they are a cohesive unit, and they are ready, getting ready to go into the land, and there they're going to be on a completely different level of life than they were in the desert. As we know, they're going to have to take initiative. It's all about the initiative that they're going to take. That's what we talked about last week in the video. They're going to be stepping up to the plate, and they're going to be bringing it on this is what Hashem wants. Hashem wants them to take responsibility. And I think that responsibility and that whole spirit of putting heart in it and going the distance and going extra like Pinchas was willing to do and like the girls of Tzlavcha were willing to do, I think that is actually exemplified by the idea of making uh, a vow that was not something that was necessary or required of me, but mm -hmm. my going an extra step and wanting to sanctify something. And this has to, it's very complicated and we don't have so much time now to, to, to understand the, the full depth of these verses. It has to do with life in the time of the temple and what it means to have an outlook of reality, seeing things as what they are, what they, what they can be used for, how they can be elevated to a higher purpose. That's what this vowing and oath business is all about making something sacred. Mm -hmm. And again, that's that's going to be the nature of the generation that enters into the land. They are going to be equipped to actually um, render something sacred mm -hmm. and to actually be in this position of making an arousal for God, of, 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 ta of taking this initiative. It's, it's the opposite of the passivity of the generation of the desert. Yes. Okay, so, so I'm just trying to say, but the thing is, the, the difference bet between Reuven and God, because uh, I interrupted you in the beginning, because you were saying, like, he didn't, you're pointing out this, this very interesting thing, that Moshe didn't go to God mm -hmm. with this question. He went to, that, to God with the uh, daughters of Tzlavchad, and their request, he went to God with earlier in Parshat Balotcha, with the second Passover request. Mm -hmm. He didn't go to God here, because I think there wasn't a question. They, wa they, wa they, they, they weren't, w in other words, 
it's not like the halacha is like you're all, you all have to go into Israel now. That's like that's that was the whole reality. That was the whole reality. So and so then they come along and they say, you know, we'd rather stay here. Nothing had to be amended here. Nothing nothing could be amended because if they didn't have it in their heart, mm -hmm. I think that's what Moshe was upset about. Like the, the, like you're taking after the spies. Your forefathers, the spies. Like that you're that you're willing to stay here. And and again, if you examine the verses of the request, uh, and many commentators have pointed out that they're the way that they related to the land of Israel was in a very secular way. Right, right. You know, I, I went to a certain uh, function a couple weeks ago, a social function. I was seated at a table with some people that I do not know. It happens sometimes when you go to a, an affair. I was seated at a table with people that I do not know, and there were people there that uh, moved to Israel, some of them... Um, Recently, some of them closer to the time that that I that I made Aliyah to Israel, which is almost 40 years ago. And and uh, these people were talking about um, the difficulties of making a living in Israel and uh, how this one went back and they and and they came here and they tried to raise their children here, but the children went back and now they're making a living in America. But I'm so proud of them. And he has this car and that car and he's this doctor and that doctor and different things and and uh, they paid for theirs, whatever it is. And I'm thinking to myself that the whole way that these people had of relating to the land was was uh, economic. Mm -hmm. That's the only way that they were looking at it. I didn't hear them say a word about what it means to be here, why are we here all together. Their whole way of relating to it was like, you know, like the level of lifestyle and and um, economic gain that uh, to be considered and weighed about living here as, a, as opposed to living somewhere else. And I've seen in many of the commentators that is a criticism that is leveled right. against the request of Reuben and God because their whole way of looking at everything was like, oh, gee, what's we got good a lot of sheep. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, oh, th this has our name all over it. Like, yeah, oh, oh, the fact is, like Hashem has been talking for umpteen dorot generations since Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov about coming into land that I promise you because that's where I want you to be because that's where you're going to be plugged in because that's what represents me because that's what represents my sovereignty in this world because that's what's holy because that's where the holy temple is because that's where the Shekhinah is and they're like, well, the grass is greener. Literally, right. they said the grass is greener on the other side of the Jordan uh -huh. and that was uh, the problem that Moshe was facing here yes. and, not, and, and not only that, but but uh, when they made their deal, they said uh, we will. Uh, so Moshe said, "Okay, so like put your kids here, put everybody down, build what you need to build, and then go out and be the first to fight in the vanguard." And they said, "Okay, we'll we'll uh, build pens for the flock and cities for our small children." And right. they put their livestock again before their children, even right? They put their livestock before their children. Um, but then later, when they, when they, when, when, uh, when Moshe explained to them uh, what um, he he required of them, they reversed the order. Yes. And they put their children first, and they understood what it was all about. But the, but but what's called a gisha chilonit, a secular attitude mm -hmm. towards the land of Israel, is really what the problem was here. I find us, you know, very. We had the same thing today, is what I I'm trying to say. I was going to say the, uh, the parallel today, uh, is there's many parallels today, but getting back to our subject, uh, the first half of the show about about the the three weeks of mourning, about the Holy Temple, about the Temple Mount. The you know uh, after '67, when the Temple Mount was in our hands, uh, you know, many people said, "Well, thank you, God. We'll 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 stay with the Kotel. We'll stay with the Western Wall." You know that's fine for us. You, you know, you've been promising for our, our, our prophets have been saying for two thousand years that we're going to return and we're going to rebuild the holy temple, and now we actually have the ability to do it. But you know what? We'll stay down here below. We'll stay in the Western Wall Plaza. That'll be fine for us. Thank you very much. And that, to me, is very similar to the attitude of of, of Reuven and God, with the with the uh, exception, of course, that many of those people who who, or maybe all of those people who said we'll stay in the in the culto didn't say, well, we'll be in the vanguard for building the the holy temple when when it comes to that. But uh, again, it's it's uh, it's a completely different worldview. Uh, whether you see things through the lens of the sacred, or you see things through the lens of the profane, and that was the difference between the tribes of Reuven and God and the other tribes, and certainly the, the Benota, the, the daughters of Tzlav Chad, who, again, as you pointed out, Rabbi, last week, their desire to 
to receive the inheritance wasn't for their own personal uh, wealth or... Uh, no, it was a direct reflection of their, their intense love for the land. The land. Uh, they're, they're, because the land to them was sacred. And like you said, it was like it was almost like a vow. Like we have a vow to. to yes, it goes. It, it connects to the beginning of the Torah yes. portion because because uh, to be to be here, and to make it work, uh, against uh, the odds is um, that extra that little that little something, that has to be called forth from the, the the resources of the depths of the of the soul of a Jew who realizes that this is, the only place that we could be in, no matter if the grass is green or not. First of all, it's very very green here greener here today than it is on the other side of the Jordan. It's, that's for sure. <laughs> and I th it's very interesting also uh, as we conclude uh, next week we'll be concluding the book of Numbers and concluding Israel's existence in, in the desert, in the wilderness. And in fact this week Moshe is uh, he goes up to, it was like last week actually last part, said, Moshe goes up to, to look right. Har to, to look over because he's not going to go in. It's at the end of the 40 years now. And so these two you know, diametrically opposed uh, approaches and, and, and understandings of reality, the daughters of Tzlavchar on the one hand and, and Reuven and God on the other, is almost, it's a challenge for the, for the future generations, for today's generation, uh, that's posed at the conclusion of, of the Book of Numbers. You know, how do we see it? How do we see the land? Is it just, you know, are we going to make it there economically or is there a, a higher value to it, to being here? A higher value that that overrides the economic considerations and ultimately ultimately um, solves you know the ec when you're here for a higher reason the other issues those secular issues work themselves out you know it works um, because you're here for a higher purpose so at the conclusion of the desert experience and this is really the this is it it's over following next week, which the next week's, uh, much of that Torah reading is, is a really a, a, a uh, what's the word, a recitation, a, a sort uh, of a, a revisitation of all the different places that Israel right. was in the desert. And of course, the book of, of Deuteronomy, which follows, is Moshe's last uh, 37 days and speaking and reviewing all that they've been through. So we're at the end. And at the very end, we have this same exact challenge that we have today. It's in your hands. You've been brought here. You know you've been brought to the Holy Land. Are you going to enter? Are you going to step up to the plate? Are you going to make it happen? Or are you going to settle for something less? And it's the same challenge to then at the, that we have today. Absolutely amazing how we are reading our own story. This is what we always say that when we study the Torah with our open eyes and on a deep level, we understand that we are reading our own story. And this, and this is why you know we so much identify with the challenges of the Book of Numbers and the transition of the generations because we really realize that you know we, we may be here, but we still are in many ways that generation that is first coming in now. And. And Looking at it that way, also, you know, we've we've taken a real beating. You know, we took a beating in the in the wilderness. You know, a lot of ups and downs. There are a lot of low moments, and a lot of mistakes made. But we made it. You know, we're here. And you know, everybody knows that uh, uh, for two thousand years of and, and for of of of, of galut of of exile, and for seventy years of the state of Israel, there's been lots of ups and downs, and we've taken a lot of beatings and a lot of losses. But here we are, and the potential is every bit as great today as it ever was for an amazing tomorrow. And that is a very good way to plug into this whole concept that we were discussing earlier in the program about the three weeks. You know. To, to, to observe the three weeks of mourning and to just totally emphasize the past and the, f and, the, and the mourning for the temple is really missing it because we have to understand the role of the temple in the contemporary state of Israel and then we'll understand what's really missing because that's all that's missing. And that is our, our spiritual anchor, the whole concept of, of our being a nation that is dedicated to godly purpose and to living according to God's word in, in his land. That's what this is really all about. It's, it's, it is um, the completion of everything, the secret of everything. These three weeks, these bina mitzurim, these, these between the straits, between the narrow places, is really the bridge to the future. Uh, if, we, if we make it that way, if we understand it that way, 
And uh, again, as we said earlier, I think more and more people are understanding it that way. They've, they've turned uh, the three weeks from a, a almost like a nostalgic... Uh, almost like a self-mortification, just bashing over the head like, what was me kind of thing, <laughs> to something like, well, you know, there really is hope. There, re there, there, there really is a purpose. And gosh, like, we really, really need the temple. We need to get it together and figure it out. And uh, as we conclude our show, we could, we don't have time, but we could go on to things going on the Temple Mount now. You know, the, the, uh, there's just good things and there's bad things. There's a lot of chaos up there. There was a Saudi blogger who was up the Mount today who was being attacked by uh, Arabs up there because he supports Israel. It's, it's open territory. It's, it's theirs for the taking. It's, it's ours for the taking if we want it. If you want to make that step and uh, move into the future and inherit what God promised to our fathers. Here's that music, Rabbi. Thank you, everybody, for being with us on Temple Talk.